coming. I think we're going to get started now. Um, so really appreciate you coming out to uh, ACO Toronto's guest lecture. Um, I want to start by uh, acknowledging that Tor ACO Toronto is located on the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Chippewa and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, today, Toronto is host to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, uh, and Toronto is within the territory of the Dish With One Spoon Treaty, which requires responsibility of those who use the land to share it peacefully and care for it. ACO Toronto also acknowledges this responsibility and recognizes the efforts of these First Nations in maintaining the land. Um, so tonight's event, uh, I believe, is our first in-person lecture uh, since pre-pandemic, so really nice to see uh, some familiar faces as well as some new ones. Welcome. Uh, if you're not familiar with ACO Toronto, we are a charitable nonprofit, part of Architectural Conservancy of Ontario. We're the local Toronto branch. Uh, and we focus on advocacy and education uh, around the conservation of the built environment. And so part of that means programming um, like free lectures like this. Every year, ACO Toronto hosts an annual heritage symposium. Uh, and it, we pick a theme that is relevant. Uh, and currently, this year for 2023, we're excited to announce that the theme will be on heritage and housing. Uh, so stay tuned for more information on when that symposium will be happening. It'll likely be in September, uh, but that will be the theme. Um, and so I'm excited to introduce our first guest lecture as part of the series. Uh, so Megan Elliott uh, has dedicated her entire career to historic building and redevelopment. Uh, she is principal, founder, and CEO of Jill Pine, New History and Revitalize MN. So very excited to welcome Megan. Uh, first time in Toronto? Yes. First time in Toronto, so welcome. So I should start by saying, I think that this is my first international speaking gig. <laughs> and so I wanted to say thank you for Stephanie for making this happen. Thank you to ACO Toronto for inviting me, and I didn't realize this was your first event back in person, so I'm super honored to be uh, to have the um, to be here tonight with you all, I thought that I would start by telling you a little bit more about myself and how this project plays into my own career. So on this screen behind me, you'll see the the entities that I've I've started and continue to lead in my career. The one on the top, Jill Pine, that is my my own very small real estate development company. Um, I think of it as the third chapter in my career having started my career actually doing engineering as a structural engineer doing earthquake engineering on seismic retrofit of historically sensitive buildings. And I also worked as a consultant and that's New History. Um, New History is a consulting practice in Minneapolis and we work with private and public clients. The only thing we do is find ways to make historic buildings and historic sites more viable. In Leona, of course, we're talking about Leona tonight as the first development project of Jill Pine and I wanted to bring up Revitalize MN because Revitalize MN is a political coalition that I started about two years ago to specifically advocate for the Minnesota State Historic Tax Credit. And as of a couple of hours ago, it sounds like our Minnesota legislature will reenact the state tax credit program. So that is a <laughs> big win after three years of lobbying. Um, and you will hear how that tax credit was so important to this project. My contact information. You can follow me on Twitter, LinkedIn, a variety of websites. So what are we talking about tonight? I hope you're here to talk to hear about <laughs> the conversion of the St. Louis County Jail into Leona. So I'm going to give you, because um, I think there's a few people in this audience who are interested in architectural history. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the St. Louis County Jail's history. And then my own personal approach to building reuse feasibility the building, the program, the funding that it takes to put these projects together. Then everyone always asks, what's it like to live in a jail? So we'll talk about that too. So let me start with where we are. Um, you all are at the Gold Star in Toronto. The project is just across a couple of great lakes from you on the shores of Lake Superior. It's in the state of Minnesota in a county called St. Louis County in a city called Duluth. So the city, a little bit about the city of Duluth, just to put this into perspective. 
city of Duluth is the furthest inland port from the Atlantic Ocean. So what's really interesting about Duluth is that it's pretty far inland, but we get major shipping boats that are coming in. And during the pandemic, it actually became a, that activity increased because of the backlog in LA and other major North American ports. So it's a, it's a relatively industrial city. It has about 85,000 people that live there. By car, it's about two and a half hours north of the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. And it has a, let's call it a little bit of a gritty feel to it. In the um, early part of the 20th century, it had the highest per capita millionaires in the US because of all the shipping, logging, mining that was going on. It doesn't quite feel the same today. But it does have two colleges, including the University of Minnesota. It does have, it still has a large industrial workforce, a big medical center, and it is in desperate need of workforce housing. The project itself, which you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, is that is Lake Superior that you see in the slide, and that is downtown Duluth that you see there, and the project is within walking distance of nearly all of the major employers. And the project is located in what's called the Duluth Civic Center Historic District. And the Civic Center Historic District is part of and is listed in the National Register of Historic Places, which is a program that we have in the US. It's a federal program, and it's a list of sites, buildings, monuments, places that are worthy of historic preservation. It's an honor to be listed in the National Register, but it also brings financial incentives for reuse, which was really important for this project. So a little bit of history about this building. Like I mentioned, it's in the uh, National Register of Historic Places as part of the Civic Center District. It's also what we would say locally designated by the city of Duluth. So while the National Register of Historic Places brings access to financial incentives, it doesn't provide any protection for a building, but it's the city of Duluth and the local preservation ordinance that would have regulator regulatory overview of changes to the exterior of the building or potentially demolition. So part of this district um, it has four buildings and you can see the lower right, that's the St. Louis County Jail, but in that left-hand photo, you can see the jail in the background. A little towards the foreground is the county courthouse, which was connected by tunnel to the jail. So you would never have to leave the, the confines of the jail to go to your hearing. And then on the far left, you have the post office, also called the federal building. And on the right-hand side, which you can't see in this photo, would be City Hall. In this four buildings plus the green mall that you see in the photo was designed by Daniel Burnham as part of the City Beautiful movement. And he was doing a lot of work in the US around uh, civic, civic design, civic centers, and it was a big, a big place on the map for Duluth to have Daniel Burnham design their civic center. So the building itself was completed in 1924. At the time, well the budget for the building, let me say, the budget for the building was $300,000. By the time they finished it, it cost $713,000. So there was a few change orders in that process. Um, that would be about 15 million US dollars today for the county jail. So the county did actually use it as a jail until 1995 when they built a new jail a little further outside of town. And the county decided that what they would do since they no longer needed the building was to demolish the building and put a service parking lot down instead. It didn't go over well with the local preservation community. There was a lot of reaction to that statement the city council, however, kind of had a mixed reaction. And it was only by a 3-2 vote that the city council in Duluth decided to say, no, we don't want you to demolish this building. So instead, they sold the building for $50,000 to a local developer. And that local developer looked at a variety of uses for this building. So it's next to the courthouse. Maybe it can be office space. It potentially could be housing. It's got six foot by eight foot cells. They're a little tiny, but maybe. <laughs> it could be a museum, perhaps. And it kind of spun around and around and around. So my first introduction to this building was as a consultant with New History. And we were hired by the developer to developer slash owner to obtain the historic tax credits, the federal and state historic tax credits. So that was in about 2018. And I was working with the the developer, and he was thinking that, you know, I'll probably turn this into um, income-restricted housing, low-income housing, I'll bring in some 
It's low income housing tax credits. I'll stack it with the state historic tax credits and the federal historic tax credits. And he was kind of circling around and I'm watching him kind of circle around and I say, you know, I think this is a really hard project. And I think you need more than what you've got at the table. And I think I can figure this out for you, but it's gonna cost you this much to hire me as a consultant to do it. And he said, no way, I can't afford that. I was like, all right, well then here's the purchase agreement. If I can figure this out for you, then you will contribute the building to the partnership and I'll take care of the rest and then I'll be the majority owner. I think at that point he was desperate enough that he said yes. So that started a 12 month race to the finish line to find about $8 million of additional funding sources and to cut about $2 million out of the overall construction budget, about 20%. So we did it and I had another, another partner join me who, I, um, who I'd worked with on many projects and his, his area of expertise is public funding. So I pulled him, him in to help me with some additional public funding sources and he and I are the majority owners of the project. We hit the ground running. We took about 12 months to close on all the financing. That was October 21. Because of some of the funding tools we had in the project, we had to place the building in service no later than December 31st, 2022, or we would lose about $2 million in state historic tax credits. We got our certificate of occupancy on December 27th, <laughs> four o'clock in the afternoon. So it was, there were many, let me just say there were many sleepless nights on this project. Today, it's, uh, it's open, open January 1, it's leasing up, we have about, we still have some units left if anyone needs an apartment in Duluth. <laughs> so how do we get to that project? Um, this is my, this is how I think about building reuse feasibility and I share this with many of my clients who come to me in New History. And I share this with them because I think that building reuse is dramatically different than new construction. And with building reuse, we have to start with understanding the building and what we're working with. And then we've got to find a program that works, and the program has to work with the physical building, it has to work with the political environment, it has to work with what the market can support, and only after we have a building and a program can we talk about funding or find funding that works. With new construction, we can start with what program do we need, i.e., we need a new library. How much money do we want to spend on it? We have $10 million. Okay, so then we can design a building to fit. But we, it doesn't work in building reuse. The problem is, is I get a call as a consultant, 99 out of 100 calls I get is, where do I find the money? And people are always trying to start at the money end of the circle without understanding the building and the program first. And so we always have to go back up to the top of the circle and talk about how do we come around to find the program that fits and then the, the funding that will fit. So what I was gonna do next is walk you through the building so you can understand the building and then walk you through the program and the programmatic challenges that we had and then end with how do we stack all the funding to make it work as housing. So this is the exterior of the building. You can see in this photo um, that all the windows had been removed in about the 1970s. They'd all been replaced with um, non-historic glass block. The exterior of the building is granite. It's all locally quarried granite from Stearns County from a place called Rockville, Minnesota, appropriately named. This building's actually six stories. There's a full story below grade, that's the, the lower level. And then you're seeing stories one through four with windows. And there's actually a fifth story behind that sign band. And that fifth story historically was an open air yard where people who were staying at the jail for a little while would have an open air exercise yard. The building itself, um, when we acquired the building, when the city had halted demolition, they had gone ahead and put a new roof on it and they had completely repointed, i.e. repaired all the masonry on the exterior. So the masonry and the roof were in great shape and I think that's probably what saved this building because it sat empty for 12 years between that time. So this is the lower level. We'll start at the bottom and we'll move up. Um, the lower level, this building is built into a hillside in Duluth. Unlike most of Minnesota, which is on the Great Plains and completely flat, Duluth is actually on a hillside. And so this building is hil built into the hillside. It's built right on top of the bedrock. And the lowest level, which was used for storage historically, low ceiling, but what you see is 
a really tight column spacing and a concrete floor, which made for a really robust structure at the base that didn't have any settling and was sort of a rock solid base upon which to build. This is the first floor. The first floor was used for booking, for offices, for record keeping, for dispatch. It had a kitchen and had an infirmary. And it also had really nice finishes buried underneath all of the pigeon waste and lead paint and everything else that was going on. But it had terrazzo floors, it had plaster, it had plaster details, it had stone. But you can also tell from these photos that it had been prepped for demolition. So all of the radiators had been taken out, all the downspouts, all the rain leaders inside were gone. Anything of value, all the copper piping was gone, all the wiring was gone. It had been stripped. So it had seen better days. But the other thing that you can see in this photo is that on the first floor you have a system of concrete columns and concrete beams that basically form a podium. And then on top of that podium, we're gonna start building jail cells. So these are the cells. And we have three levels of these stacked steel cells. They consist of vertical steel bars and quarter inch thick steel plate. And the building is built a little bit like an egg crate where they built that concrete base and then they put the cells on top and then a concrete floor and then cells and a concrete floor. So the cells themselves, that's what's holding up the floors. And the cells are um, six feet by eight feet. So I'm trying to think that's a you know, 1.8 by 2.4-ish meters. Two people per cell. So you got two beds and a sink and a toilet in each cell. The fourth floor was really, um, I'll just say it was really depressing. The fourth floor had what they called the dark and quiet cells. And so what you're seeing are these dark and quiet cells that had no light. They just had these like little tiny windows, which always, it, it's, still, it's still creepy for me to think about these cells. Also strange because this is a county jail. Like you, don't, you don't get incarcerated in a jail. You get picked up for drunk driving or, or streaking or whatever you're doing, and you go to the jail for a couple of days. So the average stay in this jail, when, and we talked with the sheriff about this, who during construction, the sheriff who worked in this jail came and signed his name inside the building. Um, he said the average stay here would be about three weeks while you're waiting for your trial. So you wouldn't spend a lot of time here. But the fourth floor had these dark, dark and quiet cells. And then the fifth floor, which had been an open air yard at one point, they had in the late 70s, early 80s, they'd put a lid on it and enclose the space and then turn it into classrooms and a fitness center, things like that. But it didn't have any windows because it's behind that sign band. So a little bit more about how this building works, because this will get us to how we find a program that's gonna fit here. So what you see here is a, a floor plan, the typical floor plan for the cell layout. And the, the gold area that you see here is where the guards would have circulated. So if you were a guard in this building, you would come up the elevator, which is there's a historic elevator and stair in the white in the center, and you would have access to that main guard's lobby and then all the natural air and light that might be in this building. And then interior to that, you have where the prisoners would have circulated. That was their corridor, and there was a, a set of bars that separated that from the guard's corridor. Then the very interior of the building had all the cells. And then interior to that, you had like a mechanical chase, a mechanical spine that ran down the back. And that mechanical spine had the, the power, the water, the drains, the ventilation. That was a, you know, a shaft, essentially a horizontal shaft. So you have like one vertical shaft in the middle that had the elevator and the stairs, and then one long horizontal shaft on each floor that was servicing all the utilities to the cells. 93 cells in the building. Now you understand the building, I'm gonna like shift gears and come around the circle a little bit to like how do we fit a program in here? Because those teeny tiny cells that support the building are really hard to work with. And I also wanna talk, I'm gonna like take a little bit of a, a side note here. Um, because part of the reason we were working through this program, like what's gonna fit in this building is because the program that we were selecting was gonna have such a dramatic impact on the types of funding sources that we were using. So what I'm showing you on the right-hand side of this slide is a generic project cost. 
and for building reuse, our project costs are made up of primarily three things. The acquisition of the building, the soft costs, which are architectural fees, engineering fees, permit fees, all of the, the softer fees that go into the project, environmental, et cetera, and then the hard costs are what we're actually gonna pay for construction. The problem with historic building reuse is that after you spend all the money to reuse the building, the market value is usually at the top of that brown line, meaning it's never going to have the market value at the end as what you just put in to retrofit that building. So there's always a gap. And so a lot of what we're doing is trying to figure out how to fill that gap. And this is my slide that I use with a lot of legislators when I'm trying to convince them that we need things like state historic tax credits. It's like, so the market tells you it's not worth that much. Why would you do it? I mean, that's gotta be an obvious question, right? If, it's, if it costs so much, why would you bother reusing this building? I mean, the county said just put a surface parking lot there. So on the far right of the si of this slide, you see why you would do it. You do it because the market doesn't recognize all the value that these buildings can provide to the community because these, values, these buildings do provide things like jobs. There's far more jobs created in these projects than materials that are used, which leads to environmental sustainability. You can never, no matter how energy efficient your new building is, you can never replace all of the materials you just threw in the landfill. Of course, we're talking about historic preservation and heritage retention in these buildings, economic development, the domino effect that happens once you put one of these buildings back in service and you see the kind of trickle down effect down the rest of the block. That's why we're doing it. And so in the middle, in that red column, you know, how, we, how we offset that gap between the market value and the total cost is we use public sources, and I'm gonna talk through some of the public sources that were used on this project. And in the US, I know I, I've learned from Stephanie that there's not a, a corollary here for historic tax credits. But in the United States, the federal and state historic tax credits are an extremely powerful tool for incentivizing building reuse. A little bit here about how historic tax credits work and just how important they are to projects like this. So in the US, we've had historic tax credits since 1976. The reason historic tax credits were created was because at that point in US history, a lot of people had left the cities. They were out in the suburbs. We had a lot of vacancy downtown. Frankly, it wasn't so different than the conversations we're having today, which is like, how do we get people back downtown? What do we do with these office buildings? How do we fill these buildings? So in 1976, the answer was, well, we incentivize them with tax credits. We give them a tax credit for reusing these buildings. So there was a couple of iterations of the tax credits in the 1970s. <clears throat> the program that we, came, that we have today came from 1986. And what that program offered was if you buy a historic building, renovate it, reuse it, then the federal government, the US federal government, the IRS, will give you a 20% income tax credit. So easy math, if you're gonna spend $10 million on a building, you will get a $2 million income tax credit. That's a pretty big incentive. But it comes with some strings, they always do. It does mean that your project, from a design perspective, gets reviewed by our State Historic Preservation Office and the National Park Service, and all of the design and all of the construction must meet national standards for preservation. So since the uh, federal program was put in place in 1976, there's been over 48,000 projects that have used this program. It's created more than half a million housing units and there's an estimated 123 billion of private investment that it has brought into these buildings. Minnesota. So Minnesota also has a state historic tax credit program. We enacted our program in 2010. The reason Minnesota got a program in 2010 is because 2008, might, 2008 9, 10 might sound familiar because we lost a lot of construction, there was a recession, and Minnesota was particularly hard hit in the construction industry. We lost a lot of jobs. And so the reason we got a Minnesota State Historic Tax Credit in 2010 is because we needed jobs. And we needed the construction industry to put back to work. So they created the um, Minnesota State Historic Tax Credit, which is another 20% income tax credit from the state of Minnesota. From the, so it's from the state of Minnesota Department of Revenue. So now if you're reusing a historic building, use 10 million, again, for round numbers, you have your $2 million federal income tax credit plus your $2 million state income tax credit. That can take a big chunk out of that gap. 
it, it makes a lot of projects happen. So in Minnesota, since our program was enacted in 2010, I think we've had something like 178 projects. It generates a 10 to 1 return economic activity in the state of Minnesota for every dollar of state income tax credit that's given out, there's $10 of economic activity generated. Our program sunset last year due to some, I'll say political lack of decision uh, or lack of being able to come together, the, the two parties, we had a, a split house and Senate, didn't have the governor's support, and so we lost our credit. This year, as of today, it looks like we'll get it back. That's a, that's a big win for us because the construction industry in Minnesota and particularly historic buildings have pretty much all but halted at this point as people wait to see if this program comes back. So briefly, what does it mean to use historic tax credits? Um, you buy an old building, can't just be an old building, it has to be a historic building, which in the US means it has to be listed on the National Register of Historic Places. You have to do a lot of work, and the IRS has a very specific definition for a lot of work. <laughs> a lot of work means you're gonna spend more doing the work than what you bought the building for. For the type of buildings that we work on at New History and for Leona, it's usually not a problem. You know, we usually get the building for a dollar around that, and then we put a, a lot of money into it. So that's not usually a barrier. But what it does mean is that owners who might wanna use the program for maintenance or some small projects here and there, it doesn't work for that. Um, the whole philosophy behind the program is that we were trying to bring people back downtown, we were trying to incentivize building reuse, so we wanted to get these vacant, unused buildings back in service. And then, of course, you put the building back in service. And once you put the building back in service, you're able to claim the tax credits. So this design portion that I've, I've casually mentioned a few times, this design review process for reusing, for reusing the state historic tax credits and the federal historic tax credits, it's a really big deal. Because what the design standards say, the whole purpose, or I should say the, the premise of the National Park Service is that if you want to use this money, then you need to show us and make us feel comfortable that you're gonna retain the historic character of the building. So we have a whole list of 10 standards and they're, they're relatively vague, but in being vague, they leave a lot of room for interpretation. And if you can imagine a project that is critical to use the state and federal historic tax credits from a funding perspective, but yet historic character is at jail and we want people to live there, that's a really tough nut to crack. So we had to spend a lot of time figuring out how do you retain jail character, but yet have someone say like, I really wanna live there and willingly go into the jail versus unwillingly be kept there. So that was a big, that was a big piece of this puzzle, um, kind of the, a couple of the standards that we have to follow, and I've noted these in red, the new use is supposed to require minimal change, and we had to make a lot of changes in this building. You're not supposed to alter features and spaces that characterize the history of the property, and that's exactly what we wanted and needed to do. And the construction techniques need to be preserved. And here we've got a building where the physical jail cells hold up the rest of the building. So here's how we did it. This is that same, that same plan. This is the uh, plan for the cell blocks at levels two, three, and four. Oops, I'm sorry. So where we had that mechanical chase, that horizontal spine, that frankly probably hadn't, <laughs> had a little like metal door with a key and probably no one had opened it since like 1945. It turned out to be about four feet wide, a little over a meter wide and was just about the right size for a residential corridor. So we were able to clear all the pipes out and turn that into the new corridor for the residential units. And then combined the cells along with those two, the guards corridor and the prisoners corridor to make reasonably sized units. So from a circulation perspective, we sort of turned the building inside out to give the natural right, light and the natural air to the new residential units and then move the circulation to the inside of the building. This was not an easy sell to the National Park Service. We had a lot of back and forth. Um, to use the historic tax credit program, we do have the opportunity to you know, do what's called a preliminary application, send something into the National Park Service and get their feedback. So we had a couple back, back and forths, but we did, the trade-off that they gave us was, well, you can, you can do this, 
but in exchange, you're going to keep as much of the jail character and feeling in all of the common spaces. So that was our trade-off. So here's that, um, on the left-hand side, you can see that corridor that was jammed full of pipes, drains. On the right-hand side is the new corridor for residents. I mentioned that the structure holds up the floors above. So on the left-hand side, you can see removing the bars from a construction sequence perspective, every time we removed a set of bars, vertical set of bars, or a steel wall, first we had to put in a channel or a column to replace it. So we had to thread in all of the new structure, essentially by hand, carrying the steel in through up the stairs to get all the new structure in place before we could start demoing the old structure. And essentially, the, the building, the only way to do this is really by hand, just given the tight quarters. So you're essentially using like sheer people power to cut the bars and remove them. And some of them went out, just got tossed out the window. And in the end, we did end up keeping a lot of the bars. You can see this is a typical unit. This is a studio efficiency unit because those bars are structure. So every time we took one out, we'd have to put new steel in. Um, overall, the building was built with about 250 tons of steel we removed about 200 tons of steel. The other uh, big piece of this puzzle was the mechanical systems for the building. So there was about a one and a half to two million dollar savings by moving from a forced air ducted system to using natural ventilation. So we did make the decision as owners and developers that we're on Lake Superior, Duluth is a really cold place to live, so maybe we can get away without air conditioning. So we removed the air conditioning from the project entirely and switched to a system of natural ventilation. The windows themselves are, the architects in the room will, will understand this, they're too, they're too low. So if we were to remove all of the bars, we'd have to have a, a, a closure device that wouldn't allow you to open the window all the way for fear of falling out. So the compromise in the solution was to keep the lowest rung of bars that's shown there in red and that now the, the city building code official accepted that as the windowsill height was the top of that lowest rung of bars. So now we've kept those lowest rung of bars, which allows us to, in our residence, I should say, can open the windows all the way up and get in all the air from Lake Superior. And that had a dramatic impact on cost, as well as ductwork. So we, we no longer have, there's really no ductwork in this, in this building because we're moving, we're heating the building with uh, radiant water. So just running pipes through the building to radiators. So here's an example of how those windows looked before on the left with the full height bars. Then on the right, you can see how you have the lowest rung of the bars kept in place to be the new windowsill, and then the fully operable windows. Coming back to programming and a round of funding. So now we have, we feel like we have a program that's gonna work in the building. It's not easy, but we feel like we have a program that's, not, that's gonna finally work. And we've been iterating between program and funding this whole time because we're gonna have to find public funding sources that are gonna be able to support this project. So on the left-hand side, you see all of our costs. It adds up to about $11.1 .1 million for this project. And on the right-hand side, you see our stack of sources, meaning all the different funding sources we're gonna bring to this project. And that arrow that's really low on the page is the market value for when this project's completed. So we're not Toronto and Duluth and rents are a lot lower. So the value of the building when it's completed was so much less than what you all would see here in Toronto that we had, the, the estimated market value when complete was about $4 million. So the difference between $4 million, meaning that's what, that's what a banker would lend you, would be up to $4 million. I'm looking at Bill here. We have a $7 million gap we have to fill. And how we're gonna fill that gap is the state and federal historic tax credits, and you can see how big that impact was. So big that it was actually more than our, our first mortgage. Tax increment financing, which I don't know if you have tax increment financing here, but it's basically, uh, philosophically, it's, it's borrowing against the future property tax increment that you've created to use today to do the project. So the city of Duluth, 
uh, we were able to do a tax increment financing district, a TIF district, and use tax increment financing for the project, which generated about another million dollars. In that black space, we're just stacking as many grants as we can find. So we have a grant from the Department of Employment and Economic Development in Minnesota. We have revolving loan funds from the US EPA to do some of the cleanup. We're using something called American Rescue Plan Act money. So American Rescue Plan Act was part of the federal administration's response to the pandemic. And it was money that was directly appropriated by the US Congress to the states, and the states to the cities. And then the cities could deploy that funding as they saw best. And Duluth decided that the best use for that funding was housing. So we were able to access some of that. And then we had a couple of historic grants from the Historical Society. And all of that added up to the $11.1 .1 million that we needed to do the project. A little bit about public funding sources. So for historic buildings, for the type of work that we do at New History, for projects like Leona, for housing, historic buildings work really well to meet public policy needs and goals. And that's why we're able to use public sources. So in order to access public sources, we're looking for how we can align the real estate with what a city, county, state needs. And I've highlighted a couple here. On the, on the left is, just, is, a hand, is the sources that we use on Leona, for example. And on the right were the policy goals they were able, we were able to satisfy. And the two biggest ones, of course, were housing affordability because this is a mixed income project. So of the 33 units, we had 14 are at specific income restricted levels. And then, of course, we're doing historic building reuse as another big policy goal. You know, other things, other goals that we were able to satisfy were um, you know, we were removing blights. This building was considered a blighted building for the city of Duluth. We had to meet specific workforce goals. So with these projects, um, with Leona, we essentially used union labor, almost 100% union labor, almost 100% local union labor. And that was some of the stipulations of some of the funding sources we were using. We did end up, um, we, weren't, we didn't think we were going to do this, but we did find out that the stormwater had not been separated from the sanitary system. And in the US, since about the 1970s, that's been a requirement to separate the, the sanitary and the storm systems from the building. So that was a mid-project surprise that that hadn't been done yet. We did a lot of lead paint remediation. So all of those, every single surface in that building had been painted multiple times with lead paint, which was made it a real challenge for removing the steel, because every time that you want to cut through a piece of steel, you have to completely remove the lead paint so that it doesn't get um, airborne. Usually it's not a problem, like the lead is heavy, so it usually just falls to the ground. But if you're heating it and cutting through it, that causes a different problem with lead. So there was a lot more lead paint remediation than we had planned for. And of course, we're modernizing to meet uh, modern building code requirements. So I get a lot of questions. What's it like to live in a jail? Um, this was something we really struggled with in terms of convincing people that living in a jail would be acceptable, especially, I'll say right now in Minneapolis, we are, we are the epicenter of George Floyd. And we still have really challenging conversations about civic justice and equity and what these spaces mean, and what it means to be incarcerated. And, and we're a jail, so we don't get incarcerated here. But it still has a lot of this social challenge around it. It's a building that's never been inviting. It's a building that's never been open to the public. So we spent a lot of time thinking about how do we make this, how do we give this building a new life, a new space in the community, and how do we make it um, a public asset instead of essentially a public nuisance? We did work with a, um, a local Minneapolis-based branding agency named Fellow to think through how we're going to, we're not gonna call this the St. Louis County Jail anymore. We're gonna call it something else. We decided to call it Leona. The reason we decided to call it Leona is, uh, I should have pointed out in the image of the exterior, I had a red circle around the, the lions that are carved in the granite in the building. And throughout the civic district in Duluth, there's a number of lions that are carved in the buildings. And so we picked Leona because it's the Finnish word for lion. And Duluth has a, a very deep Finnish history. So it's the 
The word for lion, it has a much softer sound to it than jail. And we played around with how do we represent Leona in different, different block patterns to look like the masonry on the exterior of the building. And we picked some colors that brought in new life into the building. Because when most of the color, I will say the first, I'm not an architect by training. But I remember having the conversation with the architect about what the interior should be. And of course, the first thing I get is this palette of white and grays, because that's kind of like what everyone wants these days. Like, are you kidding me? White and gray in a former jail? <laughs> There's no way we can have people live in white and gray. So we did, uh, we did come up with a new color palette to use in the building. And this is all based on the historic terrazzo on the first floor. So we pulled the colors from the historic terrazzo and came up with a color palette that we use in all of our social media, all of our printed materials, all of our interior paint colors to try to give it a different feel to the building. So here we are today. This is a new lobby. And you can see the, or I should say not the new lobby, it's the restored lobby. You can see the terrazzo that had the colors on the floor there. Um, this is one of the common spaces. So unlike the units upstairs where we were able to remove most of the window, the bars and the windows, the trade-off with the National Park Service is that we had to keep the common area bars. So in all the common spaces, we still have the full set of bars and all the windows. But other than that, this space looks a lot like it did historically. That stair has been restored. <clears throat> the light fixtures are similar. The stone has all been restored. We, we're still using radiator heat, so you can see the radiators in the pockets behind. This is the before and after of the what was called the guards lobby. So when the, the guards would come up to that yellow circulation area that I showed you in the plan, on the left-hand side is what we started with. You can see the, the guards corridor was on the very, the very far left. That's where they would have circulated near the windows. The prisoners corridor was a little inward of that. And then today, this is the, the common area for the residents in the lobby. Again, you can see we had to keep the full, the full set of bars in all the common spaces. Another view of the lobby looking back towards the elevator. So on the left-hand side, you see the original elevator. We, we were able to reuse the elevator shaft. We had to get a custom elevator built to fit the shaft, and we had to work with the um, city building code official. To, the elevator is smaller than code would have required, but it fits within that existing shaft. The very far end of these photos on the far left is what's called the servery. It has a dumbwaiter in it. It went down to the kitchen on the first floor of the building and all the food for the prisoners was prepared in that kitchen and then brought up through dumbwaiters into the servery and then circulated down those corridors to the individual cells. Today, those are like work from home spaces with Wi-Fi. And this is another unit, uh, I'm sorry, another view of the prisoners corridor on the left, and then how it works and looks within, um, this would be a studio unit here. On the left, one of the jail cells, you can see one of the beds there. There's another bed that hung on top of that. You can see the sink in the background, the toilets off to the right. Two people would have stayed there. And then on the right-hand side, of course, you have one of the new units. We had this great, we had an open house for our, our ribbon cutting. And we had a guy come in and he said, you know, I stayed here once and I wanna show you my cell. So we went up and we found his cell in one of the units and he said, well, the reason I stayed here is because I got caught for streaking. And I was streaking with my best friend from college and the worst part about it is they put us both in the same cell and made us stay there for a couple of days together. <laughs> so this is what he stayed in for a couple of days with his friend after streaking. Um, so let me take any questions that people have about the project. Yes. Yes. So there are um, 33 total units. Like I said, um, so the question is if these are rental units. Yes, they are rental units. Um, so 33 total units. There's about half of them are studios. And then one bedrooms, two bedrooms, I should have mentioned that on that fourth floor we had, where we had the dark and quiet cells that were so awful, what we ended up doing is combining that with that fifth floor 
putting an interior staircase in each of those, cutting out a bay of floor and making those lofted units. So those units have uh, a first floor for kitchen, living, a lofted second floor that usually has a bedroom and den and or two bedrooms, and then a skylight on the second floor to light those. And the rents range from 60% area median income to market rate. Since this is Duluth, since it's workforce housing, frankly, market rate is about the same as our affordable units or as our income restricted units. They actually are, are leasing for about the same price. Yeah, it actually looks um, substantially the same. So we had four buildings. We had the, the jail, which is what you just saw, now Leona. Um, we had the federal building, which is still the post office for Duluth, looks substantially the same. City Hall, still in use as City Hall. The courthouse, still in use as the courthouse. And then we have a green lawn. The green lawn has been changed a little bit to accommodate some parking now in that green space. But that green lawn is still there, and they have a, a farmer's market on the weekends in the summer and some of the weekdays, and that green lawn is on a direct axis down to Lake Superior. But it's otherwise intact. Yes? So the question is, can I speculate on the cost of building units new? Um, so I can answer the question in a couple of different ways. Uh, let me see, maybe I'll go back to the slide. So the cost of building new, um, if you ask the banker, the cost of building new should equate to that market value because the market is going to say that it's worth X amount to build that building. And the answer we got back was these, these units are worth 125,000 US dollars when they're built. So that's a $4 million roughly building. And that's, that's about what it would cost um, in the Duluth marketplace. You could probably build these units for $125,000 with a deep stick construction. It wouldn't be nice construction, but it would be, it would be there. The building itself, I mean, we, had to, um, we had to go through, of course, an appraisal process for the insurance. And the appraisal process will, of course, evaluate what, what it would cost to build a similar building on the site with the 30, 33 units. And then they also have to value what, evaluate what it would cost to replace it exactly as it is. And so if you had to rebuild this building exactly as it is with the steel, with the concrete, with all the, the craziness of the terrazzo and the plaster, then that answer is 21 million. So depending on how you look at it, it's either 21 million or 4 million, depending on who you ask. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Yes, so um, I'm going to scroll back to the Duluth Civic Center. Bear with me here. So in that upper left-hand corner, you can see the jail in the very far left. If you zoom in, I don't have great, we didn't have great historic photos, but we had some historic photos. And if you zoom in really closely, you can see the configuration of the windows with the, the kind of casement style that opens up. And then there was another casement on top that would swing out. So we did replicate those exactly in configuration and operability. And then the, we had to make our best guess at the color. The color looked like it was similar to the stone, so we picked a color that was similar and compatible with the stone. I saw some questions in the back. I don't know. I've, been, um, I've heard that there is at least one family that's living there. So we have a local leasing agent and property manager. I live in Minneapolis, which is about two and a half hours south. Um, I don't, to be honest, I don't expect a lot of children or families to live in the building because there's not, there's not a lot of green space on site. There is some green space on site. And we are in the process of, of building a dog run on the back of the building because we do have a lot of pets in the building but I have not heard a lot of family interest in the building and we are expecting that we'll get more demographic of, we have a number of students that live there, especially in the income, income restricted units, and we get a number of um, singles and couples who live there. But we have not had, and I don't expect to have, a lot of family interest. Yes. So 
So uh, yes, so the question is, what am I working on now? And then what's the biggest lesson learned? Um, so as a developer with Jill Pine, I am working on a vacant school in rural Minnesota to convert that to workforce housing in partnership with some of the local employers. And that is in a very small community of only 2,500 people. So that brings a whole different set of economic factors into it. So that's the, that's the next project. Um, with new history, we're typically working on 30 or so consulting projects with a variety of different developers throughout the, the upper Midwest and Minnesota, Wisconsin, and also with some cities and counties who want to redevelop some sites in their cities. There's a, a wide variety going on right now in new history. Um, biggest lesson learned for me, we, we did not do our, our due diligence on the hazardous materials. We, um, we thought we did, but we didn't and I would totally do it differently next time. Um, the building, we had, we did what we were supposed to do. We had the, the environmental reports done, we had the testing done, and we got these reports back saying like, lead paint, check, lead paint, check. Asbestos, yep, got it. And we went down the list, and then it said floors, pigeon waste. Okay, so we have pigeon waste. And we had to abate the pigeon waste. That's all fine, and I, I have these photos of these guys removing pigeon waste which is about six inches deep in some areas, and they're removing it with snow shovels. That's how thick it was. But underneath all that pigeon waste, what they didn't check for was there was lead paint underneath that. And we didn't realize there was lead paint underneath the six inches of pigeon waste. So that totally caught us off guard for a couple of reasons. Um, of course, it's a, it's a big cost. The, the bars we were able to we just removed the lead paint where we needed to cut, but then otherwise we were able to encapsulate it, meaning we just painted over it with non-lead-based paint. And then we just monitor for any flaking paint as the, the building changes and humidity happens and things like that. On the floors, we can't just encapsulate it because you know people walk on it, they drag their furniture across it, they touch it, they're in bare feet, and it's just a, it's a surface that gets worked more, so it's more likely to have flaking paint. So we had to completely grind all the paint off versus just encapsulating it. Not only did we have to completely grind all the paint off, but we also had to put down a layer of sealant because the lead paint had seeped into the concrete because that's a porous material. So there's no way we could ever completely remove the lead paint. So we had to do like belt and suspenders of grind it all off and then put a sealer on top of it. And that was, it was about $80,000 to do all the grinding and another $80,000 to do all the sealing. So that was about $160,000 that we weren't prepared for. So I will do my due diligence around hazardous materials totally differently next time. <laughs> Front row. Hmm. Um, I did lose a lot of sleep on this project. There were a couple of things. There were a couple of like, moments in the project that I wasn't sure if they were gonna work. So one of those moments were, I, I mentioned that, um, so I'm, I'm a structural engineer by background, and I think a lot of what kept people away from this building is figuring out how to deal with the structure, that the steel cells themselves were the structure that held up the floors. And I felt, I felt like it was hard, but there was like a way to do it. But to get the new steel into the building, we had to you know, remove a strip of bars and walls to get the new columns in first. And we had to cut the column into lengths that were short enough that like people could like physically move them into the building and maneuver them into place. So you're drilling a, a hole that goes from the top of the building down all the way through all the floors down to the bottom of the building. And they're starting at the top and they're moving this hole down, going through the floor, which is eight inches of concrete on top of steel plate. It takes three hours to drill a hole. And I remember them saying, well, we thought we'd drill, you know, 20 holes a day, right? We'll just, at three hours to drill each hole. It took a whole lot longer to get the, the columns in place. And then I also remember, like, what was keeping me up at night was, what if all the holes don't line up the right way? Because no one's ever measured to see if it actually does stack up the way we think it stacks up. So until we got the first column dropped in, all the way down to the bottom and then spliced all the way up, I was really nervous that I didn't know if it would structurally work. 
Like, I didn't know if we could actually get the new steel in. So I did lose a lot of sleep at that moment. And then the other point I lost a lot of sleep, and I lost like months of sleep on this, is we had a glass shortage in the US. I don't know if this hit anyone else, but it hit us really hard. We, this is Duluth, so there's only about three nice days in Duluth, and the rest of the time it's winter. Um, so we had like a very narrow window within which we could take out all the glass block and put in the new windows when it would be warm enough. Well, the windows are supposed to arrive in July. And we kept calling the window manufacturer saying like, they're gonna be on a train, right? They're gonna be here July 15th. We gotta get them in there. We've taken all the glass block out. We're ready for the windows. And they kept saying, yep, they're gonna be there. Yep, they're gonna be there. And then like July 12th, they call and say, we don't have any glass. So that was like just a heart stopping moment. And then we, we started calling all the glass manufacturers across the whole country to see if we could find any glass from anyone that we could pay whatever amount it would take to get this glass. And in the end of the day, we ended up working with our, um, the same glass, the same window manufacturing company. They were able to get it. We got the windows in November. So we had to build temporary enclosure for the building. So we had to build a whole series of plastic windows to fill that opening and then run a bunch of just propane heaters where people were working just to keep them warm enough as the temperature was dropping. So the steel columns and the windows were what kept me up. Question there. Um, the building department was great. I will say, uh, I don't think that you can do a project like this unless you have a good relationship with the building code official. There were a number of things that we did where we, you know, we'd go to the building code official and we'd say, like, we, we can't meet the current building code, so we need to talk to you about you know, getting an exception for infeasibility. And that was everything from the elevator being too small to meet current code. Um, we had Originally, the, the building had originally, um, when I inherited the drawings from the previous owner, they had designed a system where they were putting an acoustical mat and then new concrete on top of every floor. And so that's, in some ways, that's a great solution because you just cover all the lead paint. On the other hand, you've just created like a, a vertical transition problem because you just added two inches to every, every floor. You've also added a whole bunch of weight to the building, so you were putting in more steel than you might have needed. So part of what we did from a cost reduction was to pull out all the mat, pull out all of the, the layers of concrete they were adding, reduced all the size of the steel members. But the only way that we were able to do that was to get the building code official to say, well, if you remove, remove that mat and you remove that layer of concrete, we don't know that you're gonna have the acoustical separation be between floors that you're supposed to have to meet residential code. And so they, they gave us a waiver on that. And we don't, to the letter of the law, we don't meet the acoustical separation requirements between units with just the, the concrete and the steel. So there were many, many times like that where we had to literally go talk to the building code official and say, this is, this is what we found in construction. We can't get there, can you work with us? And they actually, they, they came to the table every time and found a solution for us. Um, we did, we got a building permit before we closed on financing. And we, so in order to get a building permit, we had to have a lot of those conversations. And I wouldn't have closed on financing, and frankly, the bank wouldn't have given me the loan if we hadn't had the building permit in hand. So we did have to go through, we had the, we had the hard conversations early. And I did, when I, when I walked into this project, I did inherit a set of complete architectural drawings. And so a lot of what I was doing was the, you know, figuring out ways of, I had to bring it, I had to get about $2 million out of the cost. So a lot of what I was doing was reworking the architectural drawings. It's not starting from scratch from design, but reworking a lot of the design decisions that had been made and meeting with the building code official while I was doing that. I know we're about out of time, so thank you again for the invitation. <laughs> Thank you so much.
so much, Megan. That was really wonderful, really interesting. Uh, you have, I'm gonna go to the, maybe the last slide, or first slide. You had contact information there, so if you have more questions for Megan, uh, please let her know. Really appreciate her time. We were at the ULI conference all day today, so that was a great presentation after being busy all day. Um, and really uh, appreciate everyone's time for being here. Uh, ACO Toronto, we're a nonprofit, so the only way we're able to offer this sort of free programming uh, is through things like membership and donations. So if you're not uh, a member or um, if you're interested in learning more about what we do, please check out our website or at the desk back there uh, and you can learn more about becoming uh, a member. So thank you everyone. Good night.